soil is really um, my passion. It, I have to say that I, I grew up here. I was born in Redwood City, grew up in Belmont in the 50s, and grew up in the oak woodlands when it was still uh, somewhat of a native landscape. I grew up on a little dirt road up in the hills of Belmont. And um, so I, from a very young age, I appreciated um, the native landscape the textures, the smells in particular, um, the colors, uh, all the life that's associated with it. So, um, yes. So it's in. So it's been a big part of my life. And then, of course, working at Linkso, um, soil has been a big part of my life. I've worked at the sales counter for many, many years when I was a young woman and uh, answered lots of questions from people on soil, especially people who would come in and say, guess what, I took all my soil, all my horrible clay soil, I dug it all out, I hauled it to the dumps, and that was in the days when we had dumps, and now I want to come in and I want to get some brand new soil. And it's like, guess what, there is no such thing as new soil, it's impossible to dig out all of your soil. And uh, you're much better off to work with what you have. And so um, early on, I got involved with compost. Was uh, involved. We uh, our business actually composted mushroom compost down in Watsonville for many years. So I was involved in that project and learned a lot about compost. And then I had the great good fortune in uh, 2000 to uh, be invited by Patricia, Patricia Becker from Common Ground to go and hear Dr. Elaine Ingham speak at UC Santa Cruz, and that was a life-changing experience for me because it was all about the life in the soil and the relationships between plants and between the life in the soil, and um, it, just, it just turned my world upside down and uh, sort of made things that I really didn't understand sort of put things into place. It almost you know, even though it's based, what she's teaching is based in science, there's a lot of it that just feels really intuitive and uh, really all about relationships and community. And I think it nowhere better is expressed than in our California uh, native plant community. This is where you see, really see, the relationship between the life in the soil and the plants that grow there. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that today. I'm going to um, show you some pictures of our garden, not very many, just a few. Um, we moved to Lamamar in 2006. Lamamar is about, uh, it's between Pescadero and Mahonda, about six miles inland uh, from the coast, so we have a little bit of coastal uh, influence. It gets very warm during the day in the summers, it can get into up to 85. And then in the evenings it gets very cool and we have the fog come in from the coast. And so we live in a Dugfer, Canyon Oak, Madrone, Ceanothus, um, Coffee Berry, lots of coyote bush. These are, uh, these are sort of our larger neighbors in our community. The picture that's up on the slide right now happens to be the soil underneath a Canyon Oak that uh, I can imagine probably hasn't been disturbed in quite a long time and it's just the leaves that have fallen down. This photo was taken um, after a winter rain and uh, you'll notice when you look at it that there's a little bit of uh, a fruiting fungal body there, a nice gorgeous orange one, and a little bit of uh, fungal hyphae and this is the sort of uh, soil that you mulch that you stick your nose into and you just go, yum, this smells so good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so we're, we're, Joe and I are just so blessed to be able to live where we do and to be able to do what we're doing there. Where we moved to is an old, it was an old dairy. So it's all, um, it's all annual uh, European grasses, pretty much. And when we moved to our home, uh, it was all very extremely uh, grassy, very beautiful and green in the winter, um, filled with uh, foxtails, which uh, wasn't so good for our little dog. And, um, and uh, so we, and we're also on well water. 
So we decided early on uh, that we were going to turn that garden slowly by ourselves uh, in to a native garden. So I apologize. We are not designers. Um, we, you know, we did it ourselves, and uh, um, you know, we made some mistakes, but for the most part, we love it. And we have successfully, once our plants got established after the first year, have really had to do very little uh, irrigation uh, around the native plants. So this is an image of our um, of our garden in uh, this last June still um, very, very green and lush. Um, lots of what we noticed is uh, once we got um, sort of the soil food web established in our garden, we started seeing all sorts of volunteers come in, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Also, once you get the soil food web established in the garden, your existing plants become very prolific and are very generous with um, germinating and, uh, and growing. Um, another picture in June, and here's one uh, in September. Um, so you can see that uh, the buckwheat is um, quite lovely, and that rosy buckwheat has been uh, extremely generous with us and has spread um, all over the garden very nicely. <laughs> And what's great about it is also is um, with these native plants is then we have this great um, influx of the wildlife. So birds, um, all kinds of bees, different uh, native bees as well as honeybees, and uh, lots and lots of butterflies, dragonflies. So it's great fun to be out there in the garden any time of day. So um, okay, an another photo. You can see the grasses are uh, getting a little bit brown and the uh, hummingbird sage is um, starting to get a, a, little, a little crispy on the edges, but not too bad. So living soil. Um, living soil is really what it's all about. We really, uh, I think we're really just beginning to understand how um, important the life in the soil is. And we're just beginning to understand how much we don't understand about what's going on in the soil. And um, that is, I'll be talking about as well as I can what I understand right now, but there's a whole universe under our feet that's still to be understood and explored. So a living soil is going to build a high humus content it's going to build a living soil structure, and that's really, really important um, to understand. And I'm going to be talking um, quite a bit about living soil structure, and that's actually something that you can see with your own eyes when you go out and look in your garden. And I'll, I'll try and show some photos that show that and explain to you how to, how to look for that. The soil itself feeds the plants through nutrient cycling, so you don't need to feed your plants and it feeds your plants exactly what they want when they need it at the right time. And there is no release of nutrient down to the groundwater, which is really important. It protects, um, this life in the soil protects the plants uh, from disease. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Sequesters carbon in the soil and holds on to lots and lots of water in the micropores. I like to make the distinction between soil texture and soil structure. This was something that always confused me. And uh, soil texture is what you have. It's your sand, silt, and clay, and organic matter. And that creates your soil texture. And that's what you have. Um, soil structure, there's the physical soil structure, how your soil sort of uh, um, uh, kind of uh, chunks together in a way, chemically chunks together, or maybe through compaction chunks together. And then there's a very fine, beautiful biological soil structure, and that's the structure that we can, uh, that we can influence. We can help this biology to grow and to build this structure in our soil, and by doing that, really um, increase the health of our plants and limit the use of resources. This is a picture of uh, a handful of soil that I pulled out of our backyard. This happened to be um, in, a, in a grassy area, and I just dug in, pulled it out. 
When you look at it, you can see how many openings there are going into that soil. And that's really what I'm talking about, the soil structure that the microbes build. They create all these little passageways for air and water to get in. And as you can see from uh, that, a single teaspoon of soil is incredibly filled with life. Healthy soil is just incredibly filled with life. And we have no idea when we look at it. We might have a sense of it by smelling, and this is where your senses really come into play in living soil because the smell in your garden will tell you, um, tell you a lot. And you take a sniff of really lively soil and it just smells wonderful. There's something that we know intuitively in our bodies. Our bodies know that that's, that's a healthy, lively soil. So, you know, probably a billion or more bacteria in a teaspoon of rich garden soil and several yards to miles of fungal hyphae and filaments in a little bit of, in a little teaspoon of soil. It's hard to believe there's that much life in there. That's how small it is. And then, of course, thousands of protozoa and, uh, and a number of nematodes. And nematodes are, there's many, many, many different kinds of nematodes. I think that, um, you know, we probably focus too much on disease-causing organisms and uh, not enough on, on on everyone else who's out there. So it's just like everything in life, you know. There, it's all about a balance. So most of the nematodes in our garden are beneficial and doing really, really good work and actually keep um, the disease-causing ones in line and under control. So um, when you have a living soil, you, you can get air and water into the uh, root zone of your plant. It's not going to run off. And we've all seen uh, compacted soil where uh, the rainwater hits it or the irrigation hits it and the water just uh, either sits there and you get a nice little growth of green algae on top of it or it uh, runs off creating uh, erosion which then goes down the storm drain or out to the creek. Um, which is not where we want our topsoil to be going. When you get that water to filter through the soil, all that life in the soil works on breaking down any pollutants, what we consider pollutants, life in the soil considers food. So um, they break it down. Their major alchemists, the bacteria and the fungi, know how to work with a lot of this stuff that we're throwing at them and uh, they're able to break them down. Hence, nowadays, all the um, bioswales that are going in, I think almost all the cities, county, state of California, is um, requiring uh, bioswales for runoff water to run through um, instead of having our water drain through our parking lots and, uh, and go out our storm drains out to the bays and oceans. So, uh, and then, you know, I just can't say it enough. Living soil really holds onto water. It makes a huge difference uh, in, uh, in really holding that water in small little pore spaces and making it available to your plant over time. This is um, another, just a picture of uh, uh, some uh, lavender and uh, some Rogers red grape, which is like, uh, the most amazing plant. It just takes over. It has, <laughs> it has taken over our whole fence line. It's, it's quite um, vigorous and happy to be alive. And um, what's great about it, this, well, what's great about it is the quail love it, so they run around underneath it and have a great time in there. And now with all the little um, berries, uh, we've got all kinds of little birds running in there, flying in there and eating. And it's just, it's a beautiful plant to look at. It's great for habitat. Um, and it needs, you know, it needs zero water. I also, we also grow a lot of herbs because I'm a, uh, a wannabe herbalist. I think that um, <laughs> herbs are, uh, are really, um, important and, and have a lot of value uh, in our own health. So here it is um, just the other day, and it's still, uh, everything is still 
pretty green and pretty happy. And um, as you can see, we use a, uh, a lot of mulch in our garden. We primarily mulch with arbor mulch. We, we like that um, the best. A um, little bit of statistics on soil. So earthworms. Um, earthworms are really let you know what's going on in the soil. Earthworms actually eat the bacteria and the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes. That's what they're eating. So when you, uh, when you go and put something in the ground and open up your soil and you see some earthworms in there, that's a sign that you've got a pretty good amount of life going on in your soil already because they're attracted to that. And I, um, I, when I went through, uh, I've been composting for a long time, and what I like to do is take my compost bin and set it up in the part of my garden that's the most compacted, uh, that has the worst soil, that needs the most help. Set up, my com set up the compost bin there, and over time, you start, maybe you couldn't even take a pickaxe and get through that, uh, that soil. Over time, that, um, that soil underneath the compost bin opens up, the worms come in, it completely transforms. I actually transformed uh, class two base rock, which is rock and clay, uh, by putting a, a, worm, uh, a compost bin on top of it and leaving it on top of it for a, actually it was there for a few years but it completely transformed that base rock. Um, that base rock um, became open and porous and turned into this beautiful loamy soil. It was quite a surprise to me to see um, the worms running through it and all the work they were doing to transform uh, that soil. So when, in the same token, when you have worms, they're opening up all these little passageways. So there's a larger passageways that a worm makes, and then there's a little passageways that the microbes make. And so that larger passageway then allows air and water to get um, down into the soil, which is very important. So when you have an open soil, you and we have a big storm event, and as you've probably noticed after the last number of years, our storm events that we're having now are pretty severe, where we're getting a lot of rain in a short period of time. And so, as much as possible, you want that rainwater to be able to infiltrate through the soil and make its way down into our groundwater, um, groundwater system. So when you don't have, when you have compacted soil, sometimes uh, that soil will just never drain. It will just sit there forever, and if the, the water will just evaporate um, uh, by the, be evaporated by the sun rather than moving through the soil. Uh, carbon sequestration is another, um, of course, a huge concern of all of us, and I, I know a lot of people are talking a lot and doing a lot of work about roots and the ability of plants to sequester carbon and how important that is. And, um, and uh, that's something that we're doing in our gardens as well. When we're, when we're growing with a living soil, we have, generally have a much more, um, a much more robust uh, root system. So we're getting more carbon down into the soil. And as those little roots fluff off, they're broken down, they're turned into humus. So nothing goes to waste. It just gets transformed. And, uh, and we're helping to hold that carbon in the soil. Nutrient cycling is um, really important. I'm sure we've all thought of what happens in a forest, what happens in a natural area. You know, how do those, how did, how did that community get fed? And I know in my, my last home, which was in a sort of a redwood um, oak uh, mixed forest, and my neighbor said, oh, I really need to feed my oak tree. So he went out and um, hired someone to come in and feed his oak trees with a really high uh, nitrogen um, feed. And, you know, there's a lot of um, misunderstanding about how plants get their nutrients. And really, it's... The bacteria and the fungi, they are the foundation of the soil food web. They get eaten by other critters, the protozoa and the nematode. 
the protozoa and the nematodes excrete um, nitrogen because the bacteria and fungi and other elements, the bacteria and fungi have more in them that they can retain in their bodies, so they excrete a waste product, which is actually food for the plant. So it's taken up by the plant right there in the root zone. The root zone is an incredibly diverse uh, hub of activity um, in the soil. And uh, there's lots and lots of things going on there and lots of communication that's going on between the plant and the organisms in the soil. Um, there's a lot more that, um, I'm sure there's a lot of research that's been done on that and some of it's not so easily accessible to the layman, but it's, an, it's a fascinating topic that there is a communication that goes on between um, these organisms and the plant. So the plant gets just what it needs when it needs it. When you go out and feed your plant a um, soluble uh, fertilizer, what you're doing is you're feeding the plant directly. You're bypassing the biological system. So you don't want to bypass that biological system. You want that biological system to be feeding your plant. So um, when you think of um, uh, so what you're doing, it's, it's sort of like what, what we do. We're eating food and that food is being processed by, um, by our gut and it's being processed by the biology in our gut. Well, same with, same with the plants and soil. You can think of the soil as being the digestive tract for the plant and also sort of like the immune system for the plant. So, um, and you want, uh, you want the plant to have these sort of whole foods that are, are broken down by the biology, and then the biology is going to hold all those nutrients in their body. When you have a big storm event or uh, your irrigation line breaks or something, those nutrients are gonna be held in the biology themselves in their little bodies. They're not gonna be swept away down farther into uh, the, our aquifers or out to our creeks, um, rivers, bays, and oceans. Um, and, you know, the plants do their part to call these guys in. You know, it's a symbiotic relationship. Plants, a lot of the energy that a plant uses is released through its root zone in the form of sugar. So it's calling in who it wants to live in its root zone and who's going to provide the most, who, it's, who, it, who they're going to be most symbiotically uh, in relationship with. So who, who's going to, how they're going to support each other best, they're going, they're going to um, work together for um, mutual health. So the plant is going to release um, sugars to call in who they want to live there. My, it's my hair, I realize. <laughs> it's like, what's doing that? So here they are. This is sort of the higher, hierarchy of it. Bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, and then all those little guys that you see crawling around. If you have a compost bin, you see all kinds of critters in there. You see springtails, those little uh, white guys that jump around a lot. And um, so there's this whole world that's working together to take every single thing that falls to the ground and decompose it down to its elemental form and make it available again so that it can be transformed into something else. It's an amazing recycling system that we, uh, that we live with here on Earth. This is a picture underneath a, um, a uh, lemonade berry. And we just put, uh, at that time we were using a wood chip mulch and uh, then we just let the leaves fall down. And uh, you can see how the, the fungi is starting to work on uh, breaking down those pieces of wood chips. They're all covered in white and that's all the filament. It's turning it into humus. When, um, when we first moved to our home in Lomamar, we have a carport and we have these big dug fir timbers that are holding up the carport. And uh, when we moved to our home, we noticed that, oh, there's um, some shingles on the roof that are missing. And we noticed, oh, the dug fir timbers have all these gorgeous shelf mushrooms growing out of them. <laughs> and so we park our car in the carport and come out in the morning and our cars would be loaded with um, all, you know, decomposing black humusy material 
of uh, Doug fur that the uh, shelf mushrooms were breaking down. Needless to say, we did have to uh, redo our part carport because that's not the place where you want decomposition to go on. But it just goes to show you that they're out there. They're out there and they're ready. If the conditions are right, they're going to come in and they're going to do their thing, which is to decompose and put things back to their most simplest form where they can be reused again. So, soil life is very much like us. They need air, they need water, they need food, and they need shelter. And um, it's sort of, uh, and they need, and they are in relationship. They live in community, they're in relationship. I need to add that on there because that's a very important part of it and a very important part of our California um, native plants communities. This is the soil food web. You've probably all seen this. This is the trophic level. So if you look down from the mole and the, and the bird, those are the levels at, what they're feeding on e at which they're feeding on each other. And the foundation, um, the foundation really is the sun and plants and, and then the biology. The bacteria and the fungi uh, are what, um, are what, what they are um, the next level of foundation for the soil food web. So you have to have all of that in place. And the bacteria and fungi are really sensitive um, to air and, uh, and to moisture. So if you have a very compacted soil, you're going to have a very different uh, a life system living in there. You, the beneficial organisms that are most beneficial for our plants are aerobic, not anaerobic. So when you have a compacted, um, compacted soil, you'll find that your plants really, they just don't thrive. And I was just at a, um, in a garden yesterday where they had put in uh, some native plants and, uh, and I, I don't know when the garden was put in. Actually, I was just walking down the street and saw it. And, but clearly they had used the blower on it a lot. And so the plants were just struggling and you could see they, they probably weren't gonna live there much longer. They're probably gonna pass on uh, within the next six months or so. This is just to give you an idea of what to look for. This is uh, just some oak leaves that have been glued together with um, bacterial slimes. So bacteria release these slimes to glue themselves into the soil. They glue themselves to the plant roots. They glue themselves to the organic matter, to the minerals, to uh, all kinds of things. If you ever lay a piece of cardboard down on the ground and uh, it rains or maybe uh, you've got some dew on the ground and you put the cardboard on it, you come back in a few days and pick up the cardboard and you notice that the cardboard is all sticky that's the bacteria going to town on the cardboard, breaking it down. So uh, they really are good at, at gluing themselves in and um, helping soils to form that micro aggregation. Another picture of, uh, this is a picture of uh, just a little bit of fungal growth. So this is probably, probably a saprophytic fungi. Saprophytic fungi are the fungi that break down uh, material that has a lot of carbon in it that falls to the ground. So any sort of woody material that um, falls to the ground is going to be generally broken down by a saprophytic fungi. There are some fungi that, um, uh, saprophytic fungi that are also, um, uh, that are also parasit parasitic to plants like the honey mushroom, which is um, sort of a, it's a, it's actually a very pretty fungi. We cut down some uh, junipers at our, at our house many years ago and pretty soon they were colonized by these honey uh, mushrooms. And I had, um, this was the last house I lived in and there was an existing uh, really lovely Japanese split leaf maple growing right next to it. And I was very afraid that uh, that, that maple might be get might get attacked by this uh, fungi, but no, it didn't. The maple was nice and healthy, and uh, the honey mushrooms were just after decomposing. So a lot of times when plants get attacked, it's um, it's because they aren't healthy anyway. And part of the soil food web's 
job, part of this whole uh, job of the microbes in the soil, is to determine who's healthy and who's not healthy. And if you're not healthy, then maybe it's time to move on and make room for someone else. So we're going to decompose you and take you out. <laughs> so, so it's you know it's very important that we set the stage right that the plant is getting what it needs, so the microbes don't decide that it needs to move on. And then, you know, you all see this when you're walking uh, in forested areas where you see the mushrooms decomposing. They're quite, I think, quite magical and fun to see. Uh, chanterelle mushrooms where we live, lots of chanterelle mushrooms after the first rain. And usually uh, we can pretty much count on Thanksgiving being able to go out and harvest a bunch of chanterelle mushrooms for our, to have with our Thanksgiving dinner. And they are mycorrhizal. Um, they live in symbiotic relationship with um, oaks and dunk firs. And the mycorrhizal um, mushrooms, well, 95% of all plants on Earth have a relationship uh, with a fungi. And it's a symbiotic relationship. And uh, it's a very important relationship in California with California natives. California natives are, um, this is a, uh, a very mycorrhizal uh, system and you know you can buy mycorrhizal fungi in the store and we sell some at work but you're not going to get the diversity of fungi in there that you are in a natural environment so it's not the same thing I think that when you purchase mycorrhizal fungi a lot of that might be good for your vegetable garden but um, it's not sufficient for your native plants. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about some ways to um, get this beneficial fungi into your garden. Uh, this is a nice photo of a, of a mycorrhizae. Um, you can see all the bacteria that's glued onto it. It gives you an idea of how, you know, how closely these guys live together. They, um, they glue themselves to one another. The, micro the fungi actually wrap themselves around uh, particles in the soil. So between the bacteria and the fungi, you're creating these, uh, these little uh, clumps of soil, which then, uh, then you have, um, the protozoa and the nematodes running through there eating. Well, they're not running through there. They don't really move that fast. <laughs> but uh, they're eating all of this and creating more little passageways and pores and areas for air and water to get in and be held. Picture of a little pine tree and um, with the mycorrhizae uh, root tips. Sorry about that with the uh, mycorrhizae um, extending the root zone. So you can, see, uh, you can see how much area that root has, that plant has available to it when it has that relationship uh, with the fungi. It really increases the area from which it can draw upon uh, nutrients and water. And the mycorrhizal fungi um, make phosphorus available to plants, make nitrogen available. There's a communication that's going on between them, and the plant will tell it what it needs, when it needs it, when it needs it, which is really, really important. And I think that we can taste that in um, really well-grown organic vegetables. You can taste it when that plant has been grown in living soil and getting exactly what it needs when it wants. I'm pretty convinced that um, that when you taste something and it tastes wonderful, you're actually eating all these beneficial uh, minerals that are making you healthy and that have made the plant healthy. Picture of a, of a protozoa and just, um, uh, as I said, they move around a little bit and they make these micro pores. They make the nutrients available because they're eating bacteria. Bacteria has far more protein in it than what they need, so they have to excrete it. They excrete that, and uh, the plant takes up what it needs. Interestingly, they are also indicators of compaction. Certain protozoas, the ciliates, if you have 
And how would you ever know this? You'd have to look in the microscope and see it. But it is something, if you have a microscope, that you could see. Um, you, you could look in the microscope, and the ciliates are really easy to see because they're almost comedic. They, they go in these little circles really, really fast across the screen. And they're indicators of an anaerobic condition. And the reason they're indicators is because their preferred food is anaerobic bacteria. So there's always there's all these messages out there um, that we can we can learn about and um, and then uh, translate and begin to understand what's going on better. This is uh, like I said, there's all kinds of nematodes. So this is a nematode that's eating a root feeding nematode. So there's lots and lots of them out there. There are um, yeah. There's just loads of them. And when you have, um, I know in, I think in San Mateo, there is a, a concern, a problem with um, root feeding nematodes in some of the trees. And that's a sign of compaction too. Um, when you've got a lot of root feeding nematodes going on, that means that your predators who need air um, aren't getting the oxygen they need. So more than likely it's a compacted situation and, um, and that's why the root feeding nematodes are taking over. So whenever anything is out of balance, it's always a sign for you uh, to look and see what's, what's missing, what's missing. Um, this is interesting too. This is just what worms do for us, how much soil they move, um, how much they bring down from underneath and bring up to the surface. They are, their um, castings that they release are little inoculation chambers. Their guts are little inoculation chambers. So they're releasing these castings that are just filled with life. So they're just adding more and more life um, and uh, creating these great passageways for air and water to move through the soil. So, as I said, balance. It's, all, it's always about balance, isn't it? In life, it's always about balance for everything, and it's the, it's the same for the soil. You need uh, a complete soil food web, and you also need to realize that, um, that some of the pests that are in our garden um, are actually, you need to look at them in a different way. You need to get curious about your pests. When you have a pest in the garden, Go out and Google it and get to know it as well as you can, and then go and see who's eating this pest, and then invite that, that insect or bird or whatever into your garden, and pretty soon you've created a natural balance. And that's, that is um, one of the really exciting things for me about gardening with nature, is you find that there's a balance, and you're always working, uh, working with this balance. So you feed the soil, um, a little compost is good. And green waste, green, you know, I'd say green waste, but um, if you make your own homemade compost, that is fantastic. How many of you compost? Yay, okay, good, good. So that, that is the best compost there is. And, um, and for, I think for our natives, a nice uh, vegetable matter compost, more of a green waste compost is, um, is best. Um, mulch, really important. Leaves, whatever falls to the ground is mulch. You can bring mulch in if you want, uh, but definitely mulch, it's really important. Um, if you need to add a little bit of fertilizers, you wanna use the organic ones. So you're feeding the bacteria and the fungi, you're not feeding the plant directly. And as I keep repeating, they are the foundation for the soil food web, so you want them in your soil. And you want to be able to pull your soil or your mulch aside, and you want to be able to see that you can look down into it. And, uh, and you could actually, you know, stick your finger in a little ways. Your soil is open. You want to protect the soil. Um, protect the soil with plants or with mulch. You want to maintain traffic waves so you keep off of the soil. This is, a, this is our home, and uh, it's, um, you can see we have mulch there, and uh, we need to do a better job of keeping off the pathways. We need to put some little stone on, because I find myself getting off the pathways. And you know when you walk on a soil that's very lively, you, you, you feel the life in it, because you can feel the springiness of the soil. Last, um, last uh, early spring, I went to prune some roses, and the soil around the roses had visually 
risen like over an inch. It had risen over an inch. That's all the life in the soil that had opened that soil up. So it was, it was amazing. Of course, I couldn't prune the roses because I, I couldn't step on it. I have to find another way. Um, and uh, another picture of our garden. This uh, work with your native soil. Don't remove your soil. Um, you can work with it a lot by doing something like sheet mulching. Um, sheet mulching is a great way to open up your soil and um, and build the life in your soil. And uh, I ha we have some handouts at our table on sheet mulching that explains it in detail. So you can go ahead and get one of those. Um, this is a picture of uh, compacted soil. When you see this, you know that you've got some problems and you need to get in there and you need to open that soil up. And this is where sheet mulching uh, will really do the job for you. Compaction, blower, traffic, turning the soil repeatedly, too much inorganic, inorganic fertilizers, the sun, the wind, the rain. Rain is very, very hard on soil, on bare soil. It will compact it in a season, so you always want rain to fall on mulch where it can break the fall of the rain and gently uh, guide that rain into the soil, or you want to have it fall on plants and have them do it. And then, of course, lack of mulch. This was our garden when we first moved there, just a small picture of it, but as you can see, it was very nice um, annual green grasses in the springtime. We sheet mulched uh, in uh, various areas of our garden, and we went back in, uh, in August and pulled the mulch aside and stuck our hand down in there and pulled out um, two big fat worms, and we could stick our fingers right down into the soil. It was uh, really open and beautiful and wonderful. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, how to, another way to add this life to your soil if you don't have, um, if you don't, if you can't sheet mulch. So, this is actually, um, the consequences, uh, compaction consequences, um, bacteria and fungi and nematodes. Well, bacteria, the fungi and the nematodes are the most um, are the mo are are the most destroyed or damaged by compaction. Bacteria is going to be there, but the fungi and the nematodes are going to move on. They're gonna they're not going to hang around. Earthworms are going to move away. They're not going to stay there. And as the soil life leaves, you get compaction. So that's how compaction starts. It starts when the life starts to leave the soil. So, and the rainwater no longer runs through your soil, it runs off your soil, so not good. This is a picture of compacted soil that got worked on by a gopher. So we all hate gophers, but their mission in life is to open up soil and eat our plants. <laughs> and, you know, we, there are some areas where, um, you know, where we have really compacted soil and they do a fantastic job of opening it up. They also do a really great job of bringing seeds up. So we yeah. have, you know, have a tremendous seed bank of, uh, of, you know, of these seeds, and in our case it happened to be annual weedy seeds. So we would always get this great crop of weeds everywhere the gopher did their tilling. But I also have to say we planted um, our vegetables in, go in that sort of soil when we first moved there. And the gophers left them alone and we had a great crop of corn and tomatoes, but never since. So this is a coffee berry that we have growing. Our dog um, loves coffee berry and our dog also loves native grasses, much like the deer. She snuggles in there and gets herself comfortable. Um, so rebuilding soil structure. Um, in time, um, the life in the soil along with the roots of the plants will rebuild the structure, uh, the soil structure, creating passageways and chambers for air and water to get in. And you can help this. If you can't do sheet mulching, you can do it by making something called a compost tea extract. And this is something you can do at home using your own homemade compost and uh, treating our water, because all of our water, unless you're on well water, has chloramine added to it, which is a very stable disinfectant. So you need to break that down with something like humic acid, which will break the bond between the chlorine and the ammonia. So do that. 
Then uh, get, uh, we have some extractor bags that you can take a look at at our table. You get this, um, um, this mesh with a um, certain size opening. Put your compost in that. Take that bag, put it in the treated water, and then massage it with your fingers for quite some time, maybe five minutes or so. And what you're doing is you're extracting the life in the soil. You're extracting the life in the compost into the water. Then what you can also do, in addition to this, is if you uh, have a plant that's doing particularly well, um, you might want to grab a little bit of soil around, uh, around that plant. Or if you have friends who have plants that are doing particularly well that you want to, you want to inoculate your soil with that life so that they'll do well in your garden. Then you go in and get a little bit of your friend's uh, uh, soil and put that in with your compost and put that in the treated water and manipulate that bag and get all that life as much as you can to move out into the water and then take that and water it around the root zone of your plants when you know in the winter months when we're getting some rain maybe after the first rain or so so when we're getting some rain and what you're doing is you're inoculating your soil with lots and lots of beneficial life probably lots of mycorrhizal fungi spores, so you're getting those, um, that life in there. You can't buy this in the store. You know, you cannot buy this in the store. So that is um, a good way to help rebuild your soil structure. We had in our garden, we had, a, um, we had a coffee berry that was just sitting there doing nothing for like two years, a long time, just sat there, did nothing. And uh, then we brought in um, a couple uh, yarrows and planted them nearby. And all of a sudden, the coffee berry took off. And then we got this, we got uh, woodland strawberries, came in all on their own, made this huge woodland strawberry uh, garden. And then we got uh, California hazelnut. And then we got them a drone. And we're like, whoa, you know, this is what happens when you get the soil enlivened and you get, um, you get the, the bacteria and the fungi, the beneficial life in there that can support life, the life that wants. You know, we live in a pretty wild place too, so, um, so we've got a lot going on out in our, you know, we've got a lot of bird activity and a lot of seed droppings, but we never saw any of this before. This happened only after we got rid of those annual grasses and we started um, sheet mulching and mulching and bringing in a few natives, this is when it all started happening. Prior to that, there was not an oak tree on this piece of property. It was just all grasses. Now that we've done this, we've got oaks sprouting up all over the place. We've got um, buckeyes coming in. We even, uh, my husband threw down some uh, white oak, um, a couple of white oak acorns, and what do you know? Now we have three white oak trees popping up. So it really is, um, uh, quite um, amazing, enjoyable, um, awe-inspiring to see what nature does. And when we work with it, when we work with it, um, we have healthier plants and uh, we save resources. We don't have to use a lot of fertilizer. We don't have to use any chemical fertilizer. And we don't have to use very much water because the water that is there, um, the water that comes is stored. So we have clean creeks and rivers, who doesn't want that? Clean oceans, that's what we need. And we have, um, we have uh, all kinds of wonderful life joining us in our garden. We have lizards, we have, we have fence lizards, we have uh, tree frogs, we have um, alligator lizards, we have all kinds of snakes, gopher snakes, San Francisco garter snake. You know, once you create this habitat, then everyone else comes in and enjoys. And I think that's the beauty and the wonder of California natives. I feel so um, fortunate to live in this, in this, um, in amongst them. So I think that's the end of my time. Excellent. Okay. We have time for a few questions. Oh, good. Okay.